There's no way that we can just hold Bitcoin and not spend it. We've got to use it. It's got to become a circular economy. It's got to become part of the infrastructure. People have got to become familiar with using Bitcoin rather than just storing it as a store of value. Instead of having a 100 million sats, you now have 1 million bits. So a Bitcoin is a million bits and a bit is 100 Satoshis. Instead of saying 100 sats, you'd say 1 bit. Or instead of saying 2,500 sats, you'd say 25 bits. Or if it was 2,599 sats, it'd be 2,599. You know, it's, it's just a more natural way. You go to an exchange app, for instance, and it's in Bitcoin, you know, 0.000032. It's, it's just crazy for people. If it's 320,000 stats, that blows the mind as well, because people aren't used to hundreds of thousands in their monetary units. As it becomes more widespread and people want to start using it more, that I think that, you know, the capital gains element, if not for your whole stack, but for a portion of your stack, will, will need to be removed. Spending Bitcoin is really fun. I mean, using Lightning is, is incredible. It's, it's a fantastic technology. I think we get a little bit too hung up about this self-sovereignty and uh, the trust side of things. I, th I think over time we will need to start trusting Bitcoin banks. Welcome yeah. to the Bitcoin podcast scene. Yeah, it's a bit strange for me, actually. I said, I've done th literally thousands of podcasts, but it's all been Apple related because I used to have my own podcast, my own Apple podcast. I still am involved with that, but I've guested on many, many Apple related podcasts, uh, panel shows and stuff. But this is the very first podcast where I've actually talked about Bitcoin. So it's a bit strange for me, this one. Yeah, I recently discovered that uh, Apple actually invented podcasting. Like this, the word podcast comes from Steve Jobs. Is, the, is that right? Um, not quite. No, it's actually Adam Curry. Adam Curry and Dave Weiner were the original um, podcasters. Uh, and I think it, was, it wasn't actually um, Adam Curry. It was another guy who, who came up with the term podcast. But Apple in the very early days, I mean, they were great because they, they really pushed podcasting. And, and they really were the ones who publicized it to a larger audience. But no, no, um, Steve Jobs didn't invent podcasting, but he did a lot to help it in the early days. Uh, I, w I was so confused because I saw in a documentary where Steve Jobs was like, uh, Steve Jobs was like iPod podcasting. Yeah. Like he put, uh, I saw a speech where he put his, you know, I was like, did, did Steve Jobs and Apple invented podcasting? Did actually <laughs> the, the words still come from Apple? It's, it's interesting. Yeah, it, it still came from the iPod. But it it was before Apple adopted i um, was before Apple actually adopted podcasts themselves because when the pod, when the iPod came on the scene it was seen as a great device to download content to, and then uh, Dave Weiner and uh, Adam Curry actually came up with the mechanism of uh, RSS feeds and and how you would actually take a, a piece of content whether or not it be audio or video or whatever and actually broadcast that to a number of devices that would download in the background and it would appear on your your iPod or on your Mac or on your PC so the name is coming from Apple from the iPod but the actual yeah. podcasting the methods of it with the RSS feeds this is actually coming from Adam Curry yeah Adam Curry and Dave Weiner yeah yeah Ad Adam was sort of like the ideas guy bit unfair actually they're both very good ideas guy but dave weiner was the programmer uh, and adam was sort of like the, yeah, the the promoter of it and came up with lots of the concepts as well so yeah we've got a lot, lot to uh, thank adam and dave for actually i love it so much yeah i did not want to get in in this topic first but <laughs> <laughs> sure yeah it's, no, it's, it's very it's interesting natural, yeah yeah. Definitely. Um, I, you have, you wrote me three articles that you wrote also in, in the Bitcoin magazine. And the first one, I like, just want to get into that because it's always a discussion in, in the Bitcoin sphere, uh, bits and sats. And you actually made the argument why bits is like better than, than sats and using bits could promote Bitcoin. Yeah, I, I think it's, um, it's something that always, it's, it's a bit like, we have Marmite in the UK, which is uh, like a yeast extract product, which you either love it or you hate it. And I think with the thing with bits and sats is people either love it, love the idea of it or, or hate it and just don't want anything to do with it. And for people who aren't familiar with it, it's, it's, it's nothing new. Uh, I mean, bits is just a new way of, it's not even a new way. It's a way of uh, determining the nomenclature. I can never say that word anyway. Uh, it's, it's a way of splitting your Bitcoin. So as you know, you've got 100 million Satoshis in, in a Bitcoin or in a BTC. And the bit really is a, like a de decibel representation of that. So instead of having a 100 million sats, you now, you now have 1 million bits. So a Bitcoin is a million bits and a bit is 100 Satoshis. Uh, so, you know, instead of saying, uh, instead of saying 100 sats, you'd say one bit. Or instead of saying 2,500 sats, you'd say 25 bits. Or if it was 2,599 sats, it'd be 2,599. 
you know, it's, it's just a more natural way, uh, especially not so much for those people already familiar with Bitcoin, but for, for new people into the space. You know, this concept of 100 million units is it's just completely alien to them. And also, and I can understand why we went with sats, because, you know, when Bitcoin was very low value, uh, you had to use multiples of sats to, you know, you know to, to sort of equate the value to a sensible figure. But as Bitcoin increases in value, um, I, I think the, the, the move to a, a bits standard rather than a sat standard is, is probably going to be more easily adopted by people who aren't into Bitcoin at the moment, which is, let's face it, it's the bulk of people at the moment. You know, not everybody is, although they've heard of Bitcoin, as soon as you introduce bits, uh, as soon as you introduce sats to the equation, people sort of, it blows their mind a bit. Um, but, you know, the, the old Bitcoiners uh, get a bit upset because they think we're trying to replace sats or this is something new. Um, but bits actually were, are actually included in the original white paper, I think. And also, you know, the, the word sat, and I know a lot of people sort of said, well, it's, it's a homage to Satoshi. He never actually named them sats. Uh, they were, that came on later. So, you know, and we're not getting rid of sats. No one's talking about getting rid of sats. We're just saying have bits and sats. So one bit is 100 sats, and it's equivalent to $1 is 100 cents, one pound is 100 pence, um, you know, one euro is a hundred euro sense. It, it's just a more natural way for people who are not familiar with the concept to sort of get the head around, you know, you know how it how it would actually work for them. And of course, when we do reach one million, uh, the equivalent of a million dollars uh, per Bitcoin, uh, one bit would then be the equivalent of a dollar, and one sat would be the equivalent of a cent. So you know, it's it ju it just seems more sensible. But people get very upset and very uh, protective of, of sats, but you no, know, not trying to do away with sats whatsoever. And I think we need more than sats anyways. I think we need under and over sats. Yeah. Like when yeah, we eventually. have actually like look, look really far out, then we need yeah, those things. Yeah. Well, I think there are millisents. I mean, it's just a matter of moving the decimal point. That's all we're doing. There's no, there's no huge rewrite of Bitcoin required. There's no uh, new technology. It's literally just moving the decimal point. And again, this, I think both Hal Finney and also uh, Satoshi uh, themselves or whoever it was uh, also mentioned that at some point in time, as the value of Bitcoin would increase, we would need to, to move the decimal point around to make it more viable for people to understand. Yeah, especially when we move into the area where we actually spend Bitcoin, because as long as we have it just as a store of value and not of a unit of count, yeah. it doesn't really matter what we call it. But when sure. you want to have like prices and there's the supermarket and unit of account, then we kind of need like, oh, it's like, oh, I, I buy an, a banana and it's like two micro sats or whatever. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's, it's you know, as, as we get more into the, you get as, a, as a, an exchange mechanism, I think, you know, it would probably be more sensible there. It, it's also easier to, uh, to, to register in your head. I mean, if you go onto a, a, an app, if you go to an exchange app, for instance, and it's in Bitcoin, you know, 0 0.00000032, yeah, it's, it's just crazy for people. Um, and, and you, you know, if, if it's 320,000 stats, that blows the mind as well, because people aren't used to hundreds of thousands in their monetary units. Um, so, you know, just a decimal system just appears to me to be more sensible. And this unit bias actually annoys me a lot. Like the, the, the mm. people are like, oh, one Bitcoin is so expensive. I cannot afford yeah. this. It's the same thing why all the companies are doing stock splits when it gets up to a certain yeah. extent, because you can uh -huh. now with the modern exchanges, you can buy like half Apple stock. That's not a problem. It's at this point, it's just like an, an unit bias. I'm like, oh, but they, they don't look at the whole thing. They look at one piece and they're like, if Bitcoin price now would be differently divided and would be like now, I don't know, 1,000 euros or like maybe like one euro, people were like, yeah, yeah, I can buy two euro, uh, two Bitcoins yeah. of that. So the unit bios is like annoys me a little bit. <laughs> it, it, and a lot of people have said that that's one of the reasons why people get into altcoins because they do perceive Bitcoin to be so expensive. You know, if they go into a, you know, exchange full of shit coins and they see Bitcoin at, sixty thousand dollars and yet they see something else which is like you know ten dollars oh well, I'll, I'll have a hundred of those rather than you know zero point zero 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 one you know of a bitcoin it, it just totally confuses people so it is in effect like a stock split yeah and in this unfortunately uh, finance has a lot to do with uh, psychology <laughs> it has yes. uh, it definitely plays into the role but you also made the argument that uh we we should spend our bitcoin um, to drive the adoption, like you ma made some some articles about that, like why we need to spend Bitcoin. 
Yeah, I mean, it's it's great having it as a store of value. And, you know, people always say, well, if it's going to go up so much over time, why on earth would I actually spend it? You know, because it's, it's, it's crazy. I may as well just keep hold of it. But the fact of the matter and the fact of life is you, you have to spend money every week. You have to spend money every day. Um, so there's no reason why, you know, you, you shouldn't uh, exchange Bitcoin just in that week to spend for that week. Uh, because you're going to spend, you're going to spend, say you have to spend a thousand dollars in a month. Um, you, you know, you're actually going to spend a thousand dollars. It doesn't matter if it's in Bitcoin or if it's in dollars. Why not exchange it into Bitcoin and then spend the Bitcoin if we have the, the you know, the, the ways to spend it. Uh, there's no way that we can just hold Bitcoin and not spend it. We, we've got to use it. It's got to become a circular economy. It's got to become part of the infrastructure. People have got to become familiar with using Bitcoin rather than just storing it as a store of value. What do you think uh, keeps Bitcoin uh, keeps Bitcoiners to hold it? When we see all the on-chain analysis, uh, like most people, like actually just hold on to it. There's such a big percentage of Bitcoin. It's like they, they did not move since a year. They did not move since uh, five years. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think one of the issues is that it's been difficult to spend Bitcoin, to be honest. Uh, which is why we need to be able to start spending Bitcoin, and that would then improve the distribution because we we have got an issue with the distribution of Bitcoin at the moment in that. Uh, but it is sorting itself out. You know, we, we've got all the people who bought in when it was $10 a Bitcoin, and they probably bought hundreds, if not thousands of Bitcoins. And then when it went up to a $100 or $1,000, well, they then sort of skimmed some off the top, and then some of that got distributed. And then those people that bought at $1,000, when it went to $10,000, they they then sold some of theirs off at the top. And it, it just, this is this is the way that the Bitcoin actually gets spread and diffused amongst the population. And we've still got a long way to go. Um, but, you know, I, I w we're not saying that you should spend all of your Bitcoin on something, you know, uh, hold your main stack. But then at, when the right time comes, either use some of it to, for your day to day outgoings or if you have a major purchase that you definitely want. Well, you know, just take some profit at that point. And that's when we get into the circular economy again. I think one, uh, one big point is also that uh, people that actually want to spend Bitcoin, uh, they rather spend uh, the fiat currencies because they have uh, tax implications when they spend their, their Bitcoin. That's at least why yeah. I do it because I'm like, I'm all in Bitcoin anyways. I would love to just like ditch a fiat and have all in Bitcoin yeah. and, and spend Bitcoin. Uh, but the one problem is like, I cannot really spend it. Like uh, I, I have to argue with my landlord for the rent. I have to argue uh, at the grocery store, or find some other solutions uh, and then all also, I have to report taxes on that if I buy something yes. for 2,000 euros and I made like a thousand profits on that. I have to additionally spend like 200 euros for, for taxes on that. <laughs> I know that that is a problem. That and fees as well. You know, um, we want, we at the moment, to, to buy a small amount of Bitcoin to use as your weekly spend, you know, you, you normally do incur fees. So that's an issue as well. Um, but the, the, the tax thing is problematic. And I think eventually as it becomes more widespread and people want to start using it more that I think that, you know, the capital gains element, um, if not for your whole stack, but for a portion of your stack will, will need to be removed either by it becoming a legitimate currency. Cause we don't, we don't have capital gains on currency now. Uh, and Bitcoin is a currency. So eventually one would hope there'll be legislation that will take away the capital gains side of things. And that would free up people to, to be able to use it. And besides which spending Bitcoin is, really fun i mean using lightning is is incredible it's 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 a a fantastic technology and we're not talking on chain here we're talking you know instant lightning payments from from one person to another or to a vendor um i, I just love using lightning wallets to uh, to spend ten dollars here or you know a couple of a couple of sats or a couple of bits here and there it's it's it's, it's just it's actually really fun to do i, I quite enjoy it Yeah, me too. I, I tried it uh, with the Bitcoin conferences. I always do it because there mm -hmm. you can spend and you need anyway something because they are like uh, small cakes. They are like water and then you need to spend yeah. something to, to get the water. And then, like, yeah, let's let's do it with Satoshi's. And I also have uh, always like at least $50 in, in my Lightning wallet to like to spend something. Even last time I was in a restaurant with a, a friend and they only uh, took cash and I did not have cash with me. And so he uh, paid for me and then I uh, gave him with a lightning wallet the, 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 my share of, 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 the, of, of, of the coffee. And it was really cool because it was like this cash moment where you're like, ah, oh, we just exchanged uh, lightnings on, and we exchanged yeah. Bitcoin directly. Yeah, well, well uh, I was fortunate enough to go to Bitcoin Atlantis in Madeira. And uh, that, that was the first time really where every single vendor that was there was actually set up for, for Bitcoin. 
which was terrific. You know, they all had lightning terminals. Um, they also had the Bitcoin cards that you could load up with, uh, with sats as well. So you could use that for payment. Um, I, I used probably a half a dozen different wallets to, to test them out properly, you know, in a live environment. And they all work seamlessly. I even have, um, I've got a full node of, of course, and I've, I've got a lightning node on my full node at home. And I use Tailscale to uh, communicate with Zeus on my iPhone. And even in Madeira, I was able to use my own lightning node back at home to, to pay for beers and for pastries and coffees and stuff. And it just worked seamlessly. It was really, really good. I was in Madeira. I unfortunately could not go, but I uh, saw so many great uh, things from there that I was like, ah, shit, I should have gone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I love Madeira anyway, because we've holidayed there many, many times, so I know it well. So the fact that there was a, a, a Bitcoin conference and Madeira rolled in one package, uh, I sort of couldn't say no. But the, the conference itself was, it was pretty spectacular, to be honest, considering that they put it together in such a short time. Um it was just incredible. The lineup of speakers were great. Uh, the the actual conference venue it was in a football stadium, so it was really unusual in that the the stage was on the pitch. We were in the stands, and then around the concourse of the of the of the arena, they had lots of uh, f- food stands. Uh, uh, they had art installations. They had a a, a book thing where, where author could go to sign the books. They had a kids' place, and they had um, an open source stage as well. So it, it was fantastic, actually. It was very, very well put together and well worth the trip out there. Yeah, I encourage always people to like, if they are in Bitcoin, even if they don't want to work in Bitcoin or stuff like that, go to a conference, meet other Bitcoiners, or go to a local mm-hmm. meetup, or go to some something where you actually meet uh, Bitcoiners in real life. It, it changes yeah. how you feel at Bitcoin, and it actually makes this thing way more real. When you go to the Bitcoin conference and you see the expo area where all the uh, great companies are there. I always mm-hmm. uh, encourage people to uh, actually see. Oh, Bitcoin is an actual industry where people work in, where people yeah, do yeah, something, yeah, yeah. and it's, yeah. it's it's something something really nice. It's uh, something yeah. that and it's good to support people. them as well. You know, yeah, they, they they put all that effort into putting it together, so it's really good to uh, to attend and support. Absolutely, absolutely. And um, what is from for you the the what was the moment for you when Bitcoin clicked? Like when you got like, oh shit, uh, Bitcoin could be something, could uh, could be more than just like uh, some Fed. Yeah, I mean, it's going back a while now. I can't remember the exact thing. Uh, I mean, I, I actually went back many, many years. I think it was 2011, I think, possibly the first time I heard of it. Um, in my previous existence, I was a presenter. Uh, I run a screencast, a thing called Screencast Online, which is like a Mac tutorial service. Uh, it's still in existence, but I just provide content now. Um, uh, one of the presenters has taken it over for, for me. But as part of that, I actually used to speak on uh, ships. We used to do uh, cruises. Uh, it's a thing called Mac Mania. And back in uh, 2011, I think it was, we, we went on a cruise and one of the presenters there um, actually gave us um, a talk about Bitcoin. And I think Bitcoin at the time was around about $10, Twenty dollars, something like that. And it was really, you know, it was, it was quite interesting. But uh, he sort of told us to go away and, uh, you know, buy a hundred dollars worth of Bitcoin. It was too difficult at that time because we couldn't actually. It wasn't easy to buy. So I sort of left it then until I think around about 2017, when that's when I started to get back interested in it again. And it had gone up to probably around about seven or eight thousand dollars per Bitcoin. And I completely just blanked it out for the, you know, between those six years. Didn't really understand it, didn't know what was going on with it. Um, but I just it just it just came I, I don't know how, but it came to my attention and I got really interested in it. And because I was doing these Mac tutorials, um, uh, which just wasn't about Mac and Apple stuff. I wanted to cover technology as well. I actually did a couple of uh, shows about Bitcoin at the time. And that, that caused me, the, the thing is when, you, when you're creating videos for people, yeah, tutorials, you learn more yourself by preparing for them. So I, I created two tutorials about Bitcoin back in 2017. And, um, you know, I was fascinated to, to uh, not just the monetary value, but all the other aspects surrounding it as well. You know, the social impact, uh, not so much the environmental at the time, because that's only really recently when the environmental benefits have started to, to proliferate. But um, yeah, so, so it was around about 2017. I just became really, really interested. And, uh, and that was it really. I, the, you know, it's, I've been deep down the rabbit hole ever since. I wonder, because um, you said 2017, I've, I also see that, 
most people come in in the peaks when like the price went up like 2017 was a big point uh 2021 and 2020 was a big point like whenever the price moves a lot uh yeah. i think yeah. that's 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 the best marketing tool still for for, for it's Bitcoin. really strange yeah because because when i when i started to plan the video out i think it was about seven thousand uh because it only took took me like two or three weeks to to plan the video and then to record it and to, to publish it uh, so I, I did the first video and I think it was when I started, it was about 7,000. And uh, so I wrote my script and everything was starting to record it. And then by the time I would finished recording, it had gone up to 9,000. So I thought, well, this is weird. And then I planned the second show to follow a couple of weeks after, and then it had gone up to 10 or 11,000. So in the space of those four months, it jumped up by about, you know, $4,000. And, but I was, I was, I was really careful because I didn't want to push it as a as an investment or as a savings technology. I wanted to push it as a technology that people should be interested in or should be aware of. So I, I really downplayed, or I tried to downplay the fact that it was it was actually going up in value. Um, so you know, I, I really took it from the angle of what the technology was, how it worked, what it was, <clears throat> what its benefits were. You know, so the, some of the use cases and stuff like that. But all the time as I'm preparing these shows, the price is going up, and I had to sort of reflect that in the show as well. So it was a, it was, it was a bit strange, a bit, bit weird. What was the exciting thing about technology uh, outside of being a store failure, outside of being a, uh, what is it, the payment method? So yeah, I think it was the de decentralized aspect of it, and the fact that it was sort of like um, an enclosed ecosystem that sort of ran itself. You know, there were, there were no middlemen, and it just worked basically. Um, you know, and it, it had been up for such a long time at that time, uh, with very little downtime. Um, it, it, I just found it really fascinating to you know, how a money could exist with that, because, you know, we're all familiar with central banks, et cetera, and the current fiat system, um, you know, how, how this could operate independently, uh, just based, based on maths and code. And, you know, it, it seemed like magic really, you know, it seemed, and again, I think this is one of the reasons why people have difficulty in adopting Bitcoin, because it does seem too good to be true. Um, not just the number go up technology, but the fact that, you know, I know there are maintainers and stuff and, you know, the, the code does get updated, uh, but pretty much it just runs itself and, um, you know, and, and it has done for quite a while and we've never had touch with any, any major, major outages. It's, uh, it's pretty spectacular, really. Yeah, I also love the memes. Uh, every time like Facebook or YouTube or something like that is down, the memes like, oh, Bitcoin is still up. Uh, or even in the in the weekends when like the banks are closed and, and yeah, Bitcoin yeah, yeah. is still there, you can still, still use it. Uh, I love those those memes. Is the, yeah. what, what do you see as the, the most important aspect? Is it is the decentralization of, of Bitcoin the most important uh, for you? Um, yeah, I think it's, it's the lack of reliance on third parties. I think that's the most, uh, significant thing for me, the fact that you can become self-sovereign. Um, I mean, I was listening to your episode with Sailor, um, a couple of weeks ago and, you know, it was a great episode and I, I do echo his feelings. I think we get a little bit too hung up about this self-sovereignty and, uh, the trustless side of things. I, I think over time we will need to start trusting Bitcoin banks or, 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 or people who will help people onboard Bitcoin more. Um, but the fact that you, you can be self-sovereign if you want, um, is, is quite a, you know, it's quite an incredible thing really. Um, and just have complete ownership of the asset. No one can take it away from you. Um, it's, it's, it's the way it's been engineered is, is quite significant. The, this trust thing is, is really important because people don't get it. Um, we we always have to trust any something yeah. like i i trust that when i bring my garbage down that once a week the garbage is taken out and and they they do something with it i trust the the, the chair that it does not fall apart and that he, yeah. he did a great job like we trust in our life so many people and so many objects and so many things uh, along the way even like hardware wallet uh, devices and you have to trust them that they don't well, have right. anything weird uh, on there you have to trust the the parcel that there's nothing manipulated so it's it's always trust involved. Uh, so um, when, when people get like, oh, there are Bitcoin banks and stuff like that, of course, people, some people trust the third party uh, to take their keys uh, more than they, they trust themselves because they're like, ah, I, I just want to have, have that. Yeah. And also Sailor's point about when you have like a big company with like millions and millions of dollars, you don't want to go out and be like, oh yeah, I hold all the keys, please kill me. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And people, I mean, let's face it, you know, 
not everybody's going to run their own node. It's, it's just not going to happen, um, you know. And also not everyone's going to be able to hold their own keys, um, again, e either from a technical standpoint or from the fact that they don't want to because, you know, they, they just don't want the responsibility. I mean, there are great solutions, great multi-sig solutions that people can buy into, but, um, you know, it, it does take a little bit of, not a lot, but a little bit of tech savvy, you know, um, and these will become more simple over time. But but people just don't want to do that. So I think we, we need to appreciate that. And um, I, I think we'll see more and more services that will, will help, will onboard people uh, in a more simpler fashion. Um, but we, we will need to have some level of trust um, moving forward. And I see a lot of different options with self-custody. And I have a little bit of a problem. Maybe you can uh, give some feedback here, but uh, when I see uh, the internet adoption, uh, like in the beginning, uh, when I see emails, a lot of people said back then I was not, <laughs> I was not there because I'm too young for that. But in the beginning of email, people said like, oh, everyone will run their own email servers. Now everything mm. is on Gmail. Um, then like how many people could actually um, put together an email and send it and understand like, oh, okay, it goes there and, and what to do, do with the tech. Now my grandma is on WhatsApp. I can write her yeah, on yeah, WhatsApp. Yeah, yeah. So like the, like the thing got way easier uh, mm -hmm. and we and and everyone can do it now is self custody something that will be so easy that almost everyone will do it or will it always be like a niche thing and where uh banks and, and third parties will will take care of it um yeah i no i do think it's it will be a niche thing take self custody uh, although it will become easier over time and the option will be there for people who want to do it but it's interesting you mentioned email because i mean i i was there unfortunately <laughs> you know I, I was there when email first came out you know um i was i was here before you know pcs and computers came out so you know i was there to, to see what happened the really interesting thing about email and and the the comparison is that um we sort of had email and intranets and stuff uh, and we could we could communicate with our own people, you know, on our local uh, intranets and stuff using email. And then suddenly, literally overnight, or at least it felt to me overnight, suddenly that the global network was there of emails. And it, it literally happened so quickly, uh, literally within what felt like the blink of an eye, you went from having, you know, intranets to a global network. And I think we're probably going to see something similar with, with Bitcoin. You know, at the moment, we've, we've, we've got niche people. We, we, we've got people who are really understand it, but the, it's not really there for everybody. But I think, um, although it, you know, it will probably feel a bit longer than the blink of an eye, but over the space of six months or something, we, we'll probably see a shift from the current system to, you know, a worldwide adoption of Bitcoin R really, really quickly, a lot quicker than people um, are thinking of in the same way that we saw that with email. You know, it probably took six months to a year for the email to, to sort of spread itself out globally. But at the time, it, it seemed really, really quick. And I'm sort of anticipating we'll, we'll sort of have a similar feeling when we look back at, you know, when, when Bitcoin became uh, a mass medium of adoption uh, or, or, you know, the mass, mass people adopted it, that it happened really, really quickly. Do you see the internet adoption, email adoption uh, right now when we see like Bitcoin is now at a similar stage where internet and, and, and this adoption was like 1992, five, seven. Do you see like this dot com boom still coming that we had in the 2000s? Uh, no, not really. I mean, I still see sort of, you know, the, the parallel to, to Bitcoin adoption is, you know, at the time when all those hardened nerds had uh, dial up modems and stuff, you know, we we're, were logging into bulletin boards and stuff. It's, it's, it feels as though it's that sort of thing, perhaps a bit further on than that because there are so many. Uh, companies involved in it now. But uh, I still think we're in the very, very early days of mass adoption um, and things will change significantly once, uh, you know, the, the, the big players get involved. Uh, I love it a lot. And uh, one topic that I also wanted to cover with you because you started a podcast and we talked a little bit bef before that um, when you, you were in an IT career and then you started mm -hmm. as a hobby, a podcast, uh, yeah. And then you actually made it a business out of that, which sounds very familiar because I was also in an IT job. Then I started a <laughs> podcast as a hobby. Then I actually oh, was, was literally like, oh, I could make actually money from that and I can actually live mm -hmm. on that. Then I quit that. Um, when was the, the moment for you when you re realized this, this hobby podcasting uh, could actually pay your bills? Yeah, well, I, I, I originally I started off with the idea of doing a, a Mac podcast, but like an, an audio podcast. Um, and then I bought the gear, I bought the microphone, I bought a domain name even, you know, I had it all set up. And I sat down in front of the mic and thought, you know, 
what am I going to talk about? <laughs> you know, there wasn't, you know, I sort of, mm. so I sort of went back to the drawing board. And um, at the time, uh, I was quite new to the Mac at the time. I was, I've been a PC guy for most of my IT career, but it was only uh, sort of like 2004, I think it was, when I, I moved across to the Mac. And I was really enthusiastic enthusiastic about it and I was uh, evangelizing to my friends and uh, family etc and then one of my one of my uh, family members actually bought a Mac and I needed to show her how to use it because she didn't live near me so I started making these screencasts these are uh, video um, which I did the narration on to, to walk through how to use the Mac and how to use apps and stuff and then I realized that you know it's a video um, with RSS you can deliver video as well as audio in a podcast so I set up one of the first video podcasts uh, this is before YouTube um, and I would deliver the content via RSS. And then it was a completely free service, just a hobby I did at the weekend. And then I thought, and I was getting lots of people actually contact me saying, you know, we really love the videos and they're really helpful. So can we donate? Can we, you know, give you some cash to help out with the hosting and bandwidth, et cetera. At the time, bandwidth was quite expensive, especially for video. And then that sort of, you know, I said, oh, if, perhaps if I do some more videos or perhaps exclusive videos for people who want to pay for them. So eventually I went from doing like four videos, four free videos a month to three videos which were free and then one which was a, a premium video and I set up a membership site and so people could become members and then over the years it sort of went to two free videos to two paid videos then three paid video so eventually I sort of built up an audience and um, eventually it was a it was a, a membership site which we delivered two videos each week to uh, paying members but also creating some free content as well and that was that was how I was able to monetize it over time, really. Thank you. You already made it halfway through the video. And I'm really, really grateful to have you here. Two things make this channel possible. You as a watcher and listener who keep supporting this channel. And another one is all the Bitcoin brands that I partner up with, like 21Bitcoin, who support me from the very start and where I personally buy my Bitcoin from. With Code Robin, you even get a discount when you buy Bitcoin with them. And now also Bitbox. Bitbox is the simplest and securest way to secure your Bitcoin. And I heard a crazy statistic. Only 2% of Bitcoiners hold their Bitcoin in a hardware wallet. How crazy is that? Don't be in that 98% bracket. Be in the 2% bracket. And if you have self-custody and you know your friend does not have, maybe he needs a Christmas present. Maybe he needs a birthday present. And a small life hack, if you use code ROBIN, you get 5% off your order. Plus, you support my channel. Um, and now let's get back to the video. So this was 2005, six before YouTube. Yeah, I yeah. started as a hobby in 2005, and then 2006 uh, we launched it as uh, Screencast Online, which is the membership, the membership system. Uh, it's still going to this day. I'm glad to say. <laughs> Amazing! I love it a lot. Uh, yeah, also for, like my podcast. I want to run this all my life. I, I I don't want to stop it anytime soon. It's just fun to have conversations. It's it's fascinating that I can actually live on that. Yeah. Uh, but but even if I could not, uh, then I would have not do it every day. I would maybe do it once a week or twice a week, uh, because it's quite easy actually to operate it. Like all this this things that you had to do yeah. for me, it's like yeah. Eh. yeah. Well, well, when I started, of course, we didn't have the tools then. So when I started, I I did the website, I did the you know all the advertising. But well, we didn't do advertising. We still don't really. It's all membership subscriptions. So I did. It was basically a one man band. Uh, and then over time, um, you know, uh, I brought in extra presenters, uh, people to help with the production side of stuff. Um, and then for, probably for the past four or five years, I've sort of gradually started to step back. I still produce content for the show, but I was managing the show and managing. Uh, you know, the business side of it. Um, so now I've reached the grand old age of 65. I decided it was time to step back a little bit further. So I've sold the business to, I say, Lee, who's one of the presenters that's been with us for years. Uh, and I now just create content. So I'll create articles for our magazine and I'll create videos um, on a slightly, slightly reduced rate than I have done before. But it's the best of both worlds. I don't have the worry of or the stress of running a business, but I do get to create the content and I can free myself up for other interests such as, you know, Bitcoin or, um, whatever I want to do now. So I'm sort of fortunate in that way in that uh, I've sort of semi-retired. And Bitcoin has played a part of that as well, because obviously I've been I've been stacking. Uh, I have a standard pension as well, but it's nice to have the, um, the peace of mind that I've also got not just my sort of standard pension, but I will also have a, a Bitcoin stack as well, which hopefully will grow over time and, uh, you know, help me out in my in my future retirement. 
if you would be now 25, would you take Bitcoin as like your, your pension plan as well? Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, any day. Yeah. And, and the problem is we, we can't uh, here in the UK. Uh, the only way that you can actually have any Bitcoin exposure in your pension plan um, is to uh, basically follow the route of, of getting micro strategy, um, you know, adopting micro strategy shares in your pension. So you can do that here in the UK. Um, I actually did have a, a pension with a one prevention, a pension provider who wouldn't allow me to do that. So I actually moved my pension uh, into what's called a SIP, which is a self-invested pension plan. So now I've got free full control over what I can invest my pension in. And, uh, you know, I've actually uh, taken some steps to invest in micro strategy and uh, some other stocks and shares that I think are going to be uh, good. But, um, yeah, we, we, can't, we can't have a whole pension. I know in Australia that's possible that you can actually um, – put your pension into Bitcoin. Uh, so at the moment, now I have a separate Bitcoin stack and then I have my traditional pension, but I have got exposure to Bitcoin in there through MicroStrategy. Um, and also like we have a thing called a, an ISA, which is a tax-free wrapper. Uh, it's not a pension, but you can, it's just like a savings plan. And again, you can invest in stocks and shares. And again, I've, I've got some exposure to Bitcoin in my ISA uh, by investing in MicroStrategy and uh, a couple of the other Bitcoin companies, a couple of Bitcoin miners and stuff like that. So I am exposed, although I haven't actually got actual Bitcoin. Of course, in the UK, uh, we, we can't have access to the Bitcoin ETFs um, uh, just because of our draconian financial rules don't allow us to do that. So, you know, the only option is to go down, down the micro strategy route if you do want exposure to Bitcoin in, in traditional financial wrappers. Uh, it was a it was a, a massive move for Michael Saylor to uh, do that because I know a lot of people who have micro strategy and they have it as a Bitcoin play. I, I know a lot of people. Uh, I don't know how to deal with the self custody. I don't know how to deal with this unsecured Bitcoin exchange. I know stocks. I just buy some micro strategy and have exposure yeah. like that. <laughs> it's like okay, mm. <laughs> but but yeah, he, yeah. he made a he made a he made it really great. And what I'm also interested in, in when you started the podcast because it was so significant in my life at least till now um, that I made the jump from a steady career where I was working almost already six years there. To actually say mm -hmm. like, oh, I like that job. I like the environment, but I like this podcasting thing and this bitcoin thing even more so i quit mm -hmm. that ha put it aside and and do only that how was how was it for you to like jump from this hobby to a business and from this career to actually being self-employed yeah yeah um it wasn't too bad i just found that i had to be very um strict with myself uh, very sort of disciplined so you know um i did treat it as a job so when i left my corporate it job um It was a very stressful job. You know, I didn't really enjoy it, if I'm honest. You know, it was too stressful. Um, the pay was great, which was one of the issues. I sort of felt as though I had what we say is golden handcuffs. So, you know, I was on a really good salary. Um, but, uh, you know, to be honest, uh, with the support of my wife, because we had two young kids at the time, so it was a big, big jump, really, to go from a full-time, highly paid IT job to a podcaster. You know, no one had even heard of what a podcaster was. Uh, but, you know, it was it was a hobby and I really enjoyed creating the, the content. Uh, it was mainly of a weekend. So I really enjoyed it. And when people started to reach out to offer money to support it, I thought, well, you know, it's 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 potentially viable. I'll give it a year and see, you know, how, how we can build it. And um, I, I, I was lucky enough at the time because there were so few of us, uh, especially in the video podcast. I, um, I had an interview by a guy called Robert Scoble. I don't know if you're familiar with Robert Scoble. He's a, um, a, a US-based um, sort of tech influencer. I used to work for Microsoft, but he um, he was kind enough to interview me on one of his shows. And uh, to be honest, it sort of took off from there because he had a big audience. So people got involved, uh, got interested, came to see the site, signed up as members. And, you know, it, it sort of snowballed from there, really. But yeah, it's, it, it was a big leap, a big leap of faith. Um, but I treated it as a job. So I'd always, I'd work every day, Monday to Friday, nine till five. Um, and I, I'm fortunate in that I'm, I could work by myself quite easily. You know, I didn't need a, a, a team around me to energize me. I could quite easily energize myself to to actually produce the content. And it was fascinating as well. So I, I learned a lot about website development and, you know, the psychology of, of members and stuff, you know, and how to, uh, how to, how to grow the business from that point on. So, yeah, it was, it was a big leap of faith, but I'm glad it actually did pay off, which is a good thing. I love it because, uh, when you did it, it was way harder 
right now it's <laughs> it's like you have so many testimonials uh, from so many role models and so many people that already did it we we have yeah. so many examples of uh, content producers content creators who are like yeah. oh yeah you can actually make a little thing out of that and you can make it and you you just have to produce a video and put it on on youtube and youtube does it a lot for you yeah yeah in some respects though it's it's probably it, it was probably easier when i started uh, if i'm honest because there was very little competition uh, i mean there wasn't another mac tech podcast a video podcast that i can think of at the time i launched there were a couple of audio podcasts um, but there were no tutorial podcasts. Um, I say there was no YouTube, so um, people couldn't. F well, that's that's a negative because they couldn't find you. But you know, there wasn't really a lot of competition. I think it's probably a lot harder um, because you've got so much competition now of, of people actually developing really good quality content. That um, you know, it, I think it it would be quite difficult for me to replicate what I did then to the level that I got um, this this day and age. It really would you know would be quite difficult to do that. But you know, there's, there's 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 plenty of scope for people to still create great quality content and, and push it out there. It's just based on if the, if you produce good quality content, people will find it, and then it will be you know interesting. I, I thought it uh, it was probably harder because also there were not that many people watching. But uh, it's like the probably like there was so many less people producing, but still a lot of people watching and yeah. and and then just mm -hmm. searching for that kind of content. And now yeah everyone is watching and, and everyone is listening but there's so many people actually doing a bitcoin podcast i even like just like a bitcoin podcast uh, there's so many out there already yeah uh, but well, the, the good thing is though um that it's very similar to the mac i mean i did a mac tutorial podcast and the mac community especially back then when this is before ipods this is before ipads and iphones it was just the mac basically um the 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 community was fantastic um and very supportive so you know people people really wanted to um take the information in and i see that uh, there are parallels with the bitcoin community because you know the bitcoin community is very supportive they want lots of content uh, there's so much to learn that you know they they really do um want more and more podcasts and one of the things i was going to thinking of when i retired was perhaps do my own not not um, not a big podcast but you know perhaps a, a bitcoin tutorial type podcast um so completely away from the Mac side of things, but just, just really um, for complete newbies, you know, just just let them understand the basic principles of of what Bitcoin is, and you know how you can get into Bitcoin and what wallets are and stuff like that. But but very much aimed at the complete newbies. Um, so it, it, that was an idea I had. I haven't sort of brought it to fruition yet, but uh, it's something I might do in the uh, not too distant future. I don't know. We'll have to see. I would love it. I would love it. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, the thing is, as well, is, you know, with, with my age as well, I think there's a lot of people um, around about my age who've got no clue what Bitcoin is. Uh, I mean, it's quite unusual. Um, you know, I'm probably one of the older older uh, Bitcoiners. I know there's Larry Lepard and there's a few other people who are of a similar age to me. Um, but I, I think people would probably learn more. People of my generation would probably learn more or be more approachable or more receptive to information from someone roughly the same age which i think they're not really they're not really given that at the moment so i think there's a possibility there but as i say we'll just have to see how much time that might take up and whether or not it's something i want to uh, to, to to invest my time in probably will but you know see how how old are you if i'm allowed to ask uh, 65 yeah so 66 next year so officially retiring age next year so Oh, oh, no, yes, sorry, next, next month. Yeah, next yeah. month. Yeah. yeah you mentioned yeah. it before. And yes, I can actually, uh, right now, I have my statistics out. I have 12.8% uh, between two, 55 and 64 years old. And I have actually 8% of my viewers are over 65 years old. So even okay. uh, such a, a young guy like me, uh, because I'm just like 25 years old, uh, has a lot of uh, people that are older uh, in, in the community. And I even have like a smaller uh, community. I have like uh, uh, channel memberships also, like they are paying for each month. Okay. Uh, and I make with them like a video call each month. And there is a 76 year old guy in there uh, who I absolutely love. And, and we have great conversations, but it's like, uh, he, he, he is like 76 and I'm 25. There's a the whole life in between, um, sure, but sure. It's, it's great, but we, we can learn from each other and I, I love it a lot. Yeah. And so I think there's definitely demand, uh, there's definitely, um, uh, and, and demand for, uh, people above 60 to make content, uh, for yeah. Bitcoin. That's definitely a thing. 
Yeah, I think I think younger people as well are more familiar with YouTube and seeking content out, you know, and and researching and you know just just finding the information that they want quite easily. Whereas for people over a certain age, it doesn't come as natural to them. Um, and I think as well, the demand will only increase over time because you know as, as Bitcoin. Uh, increases in value and becomes more prevalent in the mainstream. Um, you know, older people will say, "Well, what's, you know, what's all this about?" You know, so um, I, I think that that side of the uh, the audience will actually grow over time as well. Or the people who will need uh, good. I mean, we're not talking about you know how to create, you know, set up your own node and stuff. Just just very very basic. This is what Bitcoin is. This is how you get into it, and you know, and then some of the benefits behind it. Um, you know, we'll, but we'll see. I just just saw that and, and I was fascinated by it. I have more uh, people in my audience that are over 65 than under 25. <laughs> so, really? Oh, yeah, okay. I have 6% exactly under 25 and 7.4% uh, over 65. So it's like more, more people uh, above after work than before work. So <laughs> like that, I would put it. It's interesting to, to, to see. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's fascinating. Um, a, a selfish question that I have right now for you. Um, wh what would you give me as an advice as I just started out the podcasting? Of course, it's it's way different than when you started podcasting and, and when you started membership, stuff like that. But uh, what's the one uh, advice you would give me uh, for, for my podcast and for my uh, thing that I just like started? Uh, that's a tough one. Um, yeah, it's just be true to yourself, really. And, and uh, I always put myself in the um, the other person's shoes. So, you know... If I was watching this, what would I want to get from the content I am producing? Um, you know, and and also, you know, just 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 be true to yourself, basically, and uh, always strive to deliver a, a good quality product. Um, again, you know, with video, people don't realize that the audio on on the video is just as important as the the video. So I always sort of used to strive to make sure that the production values were as top notch as they could possibly be. So both in audio quality and the editing. Um, so it was a nice polished product that you could actually ship out to people. So yeah, you just pay attention to the quality and, um, you know, that's, that should be enough to, uh, to, you know, to, to gain the attention of, uh, of a, a valued audience. I even saw that the audio is more important than the video, especially when your video is longer than like five minutes long. And my usually like around one hour long. We are already yeah. recording 50 hours, uh, 50 minutes now. Uh, 50 hours would be something. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> the, 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 because more people uh, actually listen to it, they like they, I don't know, they do laundry or they go for a run yeah. and just have it on the, the earphones. So like the audio is way more important as I see it. Uh, than the video, but the video is still great if if this has some some things to it. Like I also switch between the crit view and and the single view and stuff like that. So mm -hmm. uh, I, I try to do a lot with that. And I see also when uh, there's a, a video podcast like I did with Sailor, where it's actually like they are sitting actually in a room together. Yeah. Uh, people actually like that and and watch longer and 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 do enjoy an actual conversation in an actual real world setting and more than just just remote but people still like yeah. the remote stuff because then you can connect people from all around the world yeah. really easily i must admit i i tend to i mean oh, i mean i listen to lots of bitcoin podcasts and i have done you know hundreds of hours if not thousands of hours of, of podcasts that i've consumed over the years um but I, I i must admit it's very rare that i'll sit down to watch a video podcast uh, i think it might be because my attention span is a, is a lot less than it used to be uh whereas you know i'll, I'll put my ear pods in and go for a walk or, or walk the dog or something and I'll, I'll listen to a podcast or in the car uh, as another place where i listen to podcasts a lot um but it's very i might start watching a podcast and and then never get through it and then listen to the rest on on audio later on but the difference is that if, if there are charts and stuff when it's valuable to see that visual component then I'll, i might go back and rewatch it with the charts and stuff um but yeah yeah so i must admit my you know um the podcasts of, of yours that i've i've consumed i've actually listened to rather than watched um but you know some people are you know, some people do enjoy the video content uh the, the thing with my video content is that because it's a screencast it's actually showing you the mac desktop uh, and the software itself, so you can't really listen to it. You you have to watch it because you know the cursor's going all over the screen, and I'm pointing things out within the application. Um, so that's why mine was a, a, a total video podcast, and uh, an audio podcast would have been 
completely useless, to be honest. Although I did, people have told me in the past that they have listened to my voice to get off to sleep in the nicest possible way. They said, you know, because <laughs> uh, that was another thing with me being English. Uh, most of the audience were from the States. And I've been over there quite a few times and met quite a few people over there. And they always said, oh, we, we love your accent. I'm from Liverpool in the UK, so we love your accent. Um, but I hope you don't mind me telling you this, but I sometimes put you on in the background as I, as I drift off to sleep and it just helps me sleep. I say, okay, well, whatever floats your boat, you know, that's fine. <laughs> I, I heard that actually too. <laughs> <laughs> already oh, really? yeah. <laughs> I, I heard uh, some people have me as because I do it every day uh, uh -huh. so you can make a nice daily routine with it uh, so some people are yeah. like just like run uh, when when they are out and like oh I'm running and I have my podcast out so like like I always run every day 30 minutes put your podcast in there or uh, I I have you as my breakfast podcast or like or before <laughs> sleep to like calm down because I usually like I have non-aggressive podcast style i i, I don't <laughs> ask questions that bring up uh any debates like i rarely rarely uh, uh say to my guests that i disagree on something i rather stick to like i want to know why he thinks like that and yeah. not uh, debate him i think that's a way, way better thing and, and so people like to sometimes also relax to the podcast <laughs> as i yeah, saw yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, it's very very true did you saw, um, because you mentioned attention span, um, many people make the argument, oh, the attention span of the general population gets decreased with like the formats of, of TikTok and, and, and with the formats of the really small, um, short video form. But then there are also people that make like a Netflix marathon and they stick to it yeah. four hours. It's, it's, it's maybe not a good attention, but they still hold the attention to something a long time. Uh, do you, do you think that the attention span uh, got decreased over? your lifespan um personally yeah yeah i would say so because i used to enjoy tv a lot i used to enjoy movies a lot and now it has to be a really good movie now for me to, for it to keep my attention if it if it doesn't grab me within the first 10 or 15 minutes you know I, I'll, I'll move on to something else um although in my own podcast um it was always said to me oh you know you need to make short short content you know um but we always i always went with um like a long form video tutorial so I, I do like a 10 minute tip video um halfway through the week and then at the end of the week it would be like a long form 40 minutes 50 minutes sometimes you know which is quite a long time for someone to to, to keep attention and to study but um the long form ones always seem to do really really well people as long as they were interested in the topic um you know if, if they if they weren't interested in the particular topic they would probably you know jump out after the first five minutes or so but if it's something they wanted to learn they would actually uh quite enjoy the long form content really uh, but personally yeah I, I have found as i've got older that if it doesn't grab me straight away i'll i'll bail onto something else i now try to use the short form content uh, as a interest gen generation for the long form like i put out five to 10 short clips of like yeah. 10 yeah. seconds, one minute, <laughs> two minutes, 30 seconds, 40 seconds, whatever it is out uh, to all the platforms uh, automatically yeah. distributed. Yeah. And I see people like, oh, it's interesting, a podcast, I all like that. And then I, they go and watch the whole thing and it's directly mm -hmm. connected and directly linked to. So this is definitely something also with the in-person stuff. I saw that when you have an in-person setting, um, the short form content actually uh, performs way better if for the long form yeah. content. It does not matter that much because more people uh, listen, but then if you have short form, then, uh, this is just what I, what I learned. Yeah. Um, yeah. no, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And that's something that I was planning on doing when, before I uh, moved away from, uh, uh, sort of managing screencast online, we, we were, I think Lee is going to sort of, sort of take that strategy as well. You know, uh, short 10, 15, 20 second clips that will bring you back into the long, long form tutorials. Or uh, when I say short form, they're like 10 minutes, the tip videos, which aren't really short form, but they're, you know, uh, a lot longer than the, the 20 second, uh, sort of like TikTok type clips that there are. But yeah, that's something that we'll be looking at in Screencast Online to do that as well. Amazing. Then uh, we come slowly to our end routine, uh, which is two questions. The one question is always the same question for every guest. And the other one is coming from the previous guest. Uh, the okay. first question that is always the same, uh, what are you currently passionate about besides Bitcoin? Um, well, I'm not passionate about it, but I've just bought a 3D printer. So I've just literally yesterday, um, you 
you'll probably see it over oh it's 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 phased out but on my desk behind me i've just bought a, a 3d printer um and um fascinating you know it's really interesting to uh, delve into the technology um consume quite a few youtube videos about setting it up and uh, some of the aspects um so yeah yeah so that's that's my my current uh, obsession let's say I love it a lot. I, I, I intentionally do this question always because I think that Bitcoiners are really interesting people and that we can mm -hmm. learn from each other, uh, other than just Bitcoin and other than just uh, uh, yeah. Bitcoin and some money in the financial aspects. So I always try to get, get this in the podcast. And uh, the other end routine where you get a question from the previous guest without knowing, uh, the previous guest had a question for you without knowing who is actually the the, okay. the, the next guest. Uh, and the question for you is, can you share the moment with us when Bitcoin clicked for you? And I kind of got an in similar question already in there. Uh, when when uh, you made the, uh, yeah, I think I, got, I asked it already, right? Yeah, 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 that was the yeah. 2017, but I'm not quite sure what it was, how it had surfaced. But yeah, that, that was yeah. around about when it clicked for me. Yeah. Yeah. You, do, do you remember what made it click for you? I don't know. Um, I don't know, because it's a long time ago now. <laughs> and so much was going on at the time. But, uh, yeah, no, not really. Yeah, I mean, that's when I first got interested in it. Um, but uh, I think when it really clicked, you know, when, when, it, when it all sort of came together, it was probably after that. It was when, I, when I bought my – I think it's buying your first Bitcoin um, is the moment when it suddenly clicks and you go, oh, okay well i understand what it is now um because before then it's just an abstract concept and, and people struggle with the fact that you know oh well it doesn't exist it's digital it's not backed by anything um but then when you actually buy it and you and you you see the technology behind it and you understand oh, okay so i've now got um ownership of this bit of the blockchain and oh yeah okay and and i can now use lightning to fling it around and you actually see lightning in operation I, I think actually using it buying it using it uh you've got skin in the game and and that actually does sort of bring it all home to you uh, instead of all this theoretical um you know gubbins about w what bitcoin is no matter how many times you explain it to somebody until they actually get it not physically in their hands but until they have ownership of some bitcoin i think that's that's when it finally does click for people and understanding the value as well where the value comes from um that 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 makes it click as well you know why why it is valuable you have to spend time with people explaining why it is valuable and where the value emanates from it's not the fact that it's it's backed by something it's it's all its utility and um you know everything around that as to why it's valuable amazing uh really really cool and till you have your uh, own bitcoin podcast um where can people find you where can people uh, reach out to you and ask you questions and find more out about you yeah um Probably best on Twitter. So I'm Don McAllister on Twitter. Um, if you want to check out uh, my Mac tutorials, uh, head across to Screencasts Online. So screencastonline.com. Um, there's a whole host of presenters there who produce Mac, uh, iPad, and iPhone-based tutorials. Um, so you can check that out. I have have started a Twitter thing called Your Bitcoin Journey, which was what I was sort of thinking about. You know, so there is another, uh, but I haven't really updated that recently. But it's something I might start doing ahead. But uh, yeah, Don McAllister. I'm also on Primal as well, so uh, Nostra. So you can check me out on, on Primal. Um, Amazing. Yeah, that's about it. Mm -hmm. Perfect. And uh, thank you for being on. And for everyone watching and listening, uh, thank you for being here. I'll be back tomorrow with another episode. Bye-bye.